<laughs> okay, so yesterday we were talking about induction systems, which I can tell many of you are, can't wait to <coughs> dive into because we left off with manifold slash intake pipes. Well, let's see here. Maybe I could move this around a little bit. What is the intake manifold? It's the manifold tube that takes the carburetor. All right, so if we have an air cleaner in front of the airplane, okay. and that goes kind of like my airplane to an air box. The hell do you know has a leg like that? It goes to an air box. What's the air box do? Okay, so yeah, in this case it so it's actually got to come out like that. There we go. So air box where it might have a, a tube that's going to go off for heat. Heat's going to come in. That's H E A T heat. Where's it going to get the heat from? Yeah, muff, okay. <laughs> Dan, what's on top of the air box? We'll put a carb, C A R, carb. We'll put the carburetor. Now, inside the carburetor, many of you are like, yeah, what's inside the carburetor? What is inside the carburetor? Let's uh, we'll do this a little different. There's a lot of things. Nobody really knows. We'll make the carburetor a little bit bigger. We have a throttle plate and a venturi. What's in the middle of venturi? You have a venturi. Now let's just say this venturi is from here to here, we'll say it's two inches. Follow? Where's the suction at? In this area? Yeah. This area? How far past the venturi does the suction go, do you think? Like, is it like 50% past? So that it's like half and half? Do you think it's 0%? It's so like the suction is pretty much right in this area and maybe it starts diminishing as it gets down to here? Is that consensus, I think? Because I've had a couple people today tell me, oh, it kind of just kind of wanders up here somewhere. And, wanders down here somewhere so if you were to put a hole right there that's uh, is that subject to venturi suction no no okay we're missing a few people i guess so chris, chris. chris. <coughs> yeah who's chris partner hey, yeah where'd he go hey, uh, had enough for one day yeah. okay <laughs> How is his partner on that? Alright, so. <laughs> I'll get rid of that because it's in my way. Okay, so been, the uh, suction pretty much happens at the Venturi. Then from there, what do we have? Oh, well, like on my airplane, it kind of goes like that. And then this side goes off this way. This can go this way. And off of each one of these will feed a cylinder. It's also up here, there's a little balance tube. It goes across like this. Keep it balanced, it's a balance tube. So what are those going to? Going up to the cylinders. And we got the cylinders, right? Cylinder one. There. Just kind of get through that real quick. Cylinders. We got the cylinders. All right. So how much of that is the manifold, the intake manifold? Everything in blue, which pretty much goes from... Yeah, pretty much from carburetor on, that would be manifold pressure. 
Um, but thinking about that, let's see if I enlarge this, we can zoom into here. Let's open this up. So we got the throttles wide open. Manifold pressure is usually taken off a spot right about here, little tube. MAP stands for manifold absolute pressure right about there. So if this is about, say we're wide open throttles, that'd be about 29 inches. How far does that 29 inches go down? About there, because there's a bit of a restriction. What would it be after that? Atmosphere, 30. Mm. How much pressure do we have right, right uh, we'll say we have 30 inches here. 30 inches. So we have 30 inches here. What do we have in the, the intake duct? Like 29. Yeah, a little tiny less. 30 inches, probably. 29.99. See, that's a change. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figured there's a restriction. So. There is a restriction across the air cleaner, so it would go down a little bit. But at the same time, if the atmospheric pressure everywhere is 30, 30, then this is maybe 31. Why did it go up? Ram air, Ram air. Ram air plus prop air. So, all right, so maybe we'll say it's 31. Just for funsies. We'll call it 30. Just keep it simple. All right, 30. Keep it simple. So 30, 30, 30. Air box is 30. What do we have in the Venturi? 15, 14. Okay, that's going to be low. What comes right after the Venturi? So if that's 29, this is 30. What do you think it is there in the yellow? I mean, I don't know for a fact. What do you think it is? It's a little bit higher. A little lower than 29. I like that answer. Just say 28 just for the sake of making it simple. So... Why did it go up a little bit after that? No now you got a little bit tiny a restriction. Higher yeah, a little bit of restriction right here, just a little bit. So yeah, maybe you lose a little bit. Oh, I'm making up some numbers here. The only thing I know for sort of a fact, if this is 30, it's usually about one inch less over here by the time you get past the uh, Venturi and up. So Anyway, just bring that up to say that we're going to lose about one inch for a naturally aspirated engine. But I think everybody knows that. But right below the butterfly, it's going to be pretty close to it, though. It's not a Venturi. So, so if I had coming off of here some sort of tube that was going down to, say, a economizer, that wide open throttle, it's almost almost atmospheric so just a thought so all right so we have our manifold looks like that well that's what it looks like well it doesn't look anything like that nothing does but uh, similar to an 0470 depends on the engine so manifold intake pipes so we're talking about that manifold intake pipes well what are the intake pipes what is the manifold uh, I guess we can define it so what what would be the intake manifold that would be carburetor Carb up to intake valve. Once it's on the other side of the intake valve, that is not the intake manifold. That is called the cylinder. cylinder. Okay. Um, manifold <coughs> tubes are uh, tubes that carry the fuel air mixture to the cylinders. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm off here. Um, well, they may be exposed. They may be exposed pipes. Or partially run through oil sump. Who does that? There we go. The best of my knowledge, Continental does not do that. Uh, I guess we could talk about if it's a radial engine, then it will may go through a diffuser. I guess we can get to that later if we need to. 
Um, let's see, a four, so we're gonna do a little setup. Oh, I know what I was gonna do. So, if it partially runs through sump, this should be two things. I tried to make it one and be cool. So I'm just gonna rewrite this down here. Maybe expose pipes. Or may run through oil sump. And they had some ideas at Lake Cumming School. Why would it do that? Because somebody said, why do they do that? And then you guys usually said, I don't know, I wasn't there. Um, why would you run your a fuel air mixture through the oil sump? Okay. Slightly cools the oil. Um, warms the fuel air mixture for better atomization. Or maybe it was just built that way to save space. Nobody really knows anymore. Some systems um, use balanced intake. Use a balanced intake system. Which means all pipes are equal length. Like the engine you guys built, is that balanced? It's really close to it. All the pipes are about the same length, aren't they? Are they a little different? They're slightly different. Yeah, you got some long ones in the back, short. But you should see the what the light combing. We have one mock up in there that does have a balanced intake system, and it's like, so the tubes kind of make sense going to one cylinder, and the other one's like, well, I guess why does it come way back here and then go forward? So they add a lot of length to them just to get it to balance out. It is, yeah. Actually, the little continentals are pretty dang close. Um, why would they do that? What, what's the advantage to balanced intake system? Uh, even distribution. Better distribution. Better distribution? Yeah, even distribution, yep. Um, okay, so we got that. We have the intake pipes. Um, then if we have a heater, if we have a carburetor, So if we have a carburetor, we're going to have a carb heater, which, as we said yesterday, provides warm air to melt or prevent ice. Uh, when are we most likely to have carburetor ice? Human days. What? Um, low power. Low power is what I was looking for. So low power. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where do we get the heat? From the mufflers. There we go. Get the heat from the mufflers. So there's different styles. This one's definitely for carb heat. This is not cabin heat. So here we have just an exhaust pipe. And here's this orange tube here, the scat tube or skeet, skeet tube. Uh, comes up through here, and there's usually a little, it's kind of a pretty big mesh screen down there. Often you'll see pieces missing. If it's missing, where did it go? Into the engine. Into the engine. Uh, so you want to check that. So this is just a shroud that goes across this. So it draws warm air across that hot pipe. Goes off into the carburetor. Um, sometimes you may get the uh, actual heat muff. It looks just like that, which actually surrounds the exhaust. This very well, this one probably is the cabin heat. Carb heat may look exactly the same. One side's cabin, one side's carb. Uh, not that uncommon. Yeah. Uh, would you want to like safety wire those clamps together? Which one? Like these? The you know, it's really not that uncommon to see somebody put a piece of safety wire through here and safety wire these. And it's not that uncommon to see nobody safety them. 
Um, I don't know. I would say I've never seen one loose until today when I was or yesterday when I was working on an airplane. It's like the hose clamps were not even near it. They were just off someplace else. Don't know if that was, I'm assuming that was a mechanic since they didn't fall up. So <laughs> the muff stayed in place and the, the hose clamp was somewhere up here. So they don't usually roll up unless they're flying inverted for a long period of time. So, Carpey um, doesn't get a, like a real filter? Huh? Carpey doesn't get like a real uh -uh. filter. It's just like a... Nope, which is something to consider when you're running carb heat on. So when I'm coming in for a landing, right? I have carburetors. So I pull on carb heat. Touch down. First thing I do when I touch down, reach over, carb heat off, flaps up. Flaps is not part of the discussion. It's what I do, but carb heat off. Because it's unfiltered air. Yeah. It's up inside the cowling. But still unfiltered air. I don't want that. Um, right, so got a muff that surrounds it. That is not exhaust air going into the carburetor. It's just surrounding a pipe. And the inside of it may look something like that. And those little, if you want to make it better, put it, just screw a bunch of screws in there like that and cut the heads off. What happens if you get a... Yeah, little heat probes, or yes. What happens if you get a little crack in here? Get an exhaust, exhaust leak. Carburetor. What happens if it's going to the carburetor? What's it going to do? Shit. It's just a little leak. It's probably going to run a little rich because you're depriving it of oxygen, right? What happens if it's in the cabin heat you side? Uh, you're going to die. You are going to die. Yeah. All right. Um, these hoses are called scat tubes or skeet tubes. I can never remember the difference. Some of them look like this with a spiral wound on the inside that you can see. Some of them are double walled. Some of them are this orange silicon stuff. Some of them are black. Um, Cessna used some that, oh, they're terrible. Um, you have to, re if you're not careful, it will ruin the airplane because the uh, material degrades and the wire corrodes and that corrosion hits the aluminum and sometimes they're running by spars and stuff. So you'll, you'll lose a spar in an aircraft. So you got to be careful of that. All right, so the, the, that's these tubes here. What's the matter? <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that thing. Uh, okay, not gonna. All right, so just by the way, then these are our, our tubes for that. So um, these do not make. You have to be careful. I don't like the ones that have the inner liner to it. Be no, because I read something where sometimes those inner liners can come loose and, and get ingested. Yeah. So yeah, I had to pick some. I was reading a bunch about it, and it said, well, the air is going to flow a lot smoother, a lot faster because you don't have the. Uh, spiral around uh, spring in there. Um, uh -huh. Well, if it, um, you'd be surprised. Stuff like one time, I, I don't want to tell Larry's stories, but um, so I won't. But you get a little piece of this that just a little tiny piece that goes up through the air box and wraps itself around. Think about how like that Stromberg or even the Marvel Shoveler has the, the discharge nozzle. What if you get a little something that hits that and wraps around it, even a string or something. I was referring more to like, who cares about having that inner liner? Oh, yeah. Gonna, oh, but I don't know. What about when that fucking wire it gets doesn't. unraveled? It doesn't. Oh, when it comes unraveled? And it's like the most impossible thing to... It's do. glued in there. And so, um, I don't know if I can enlarge it enough so you can see. Well, that's all, see, there's you can see a little bit of glue right there. So it's glued in place. And how do you cut it? Um, well, you just, you cut it, and then you have to be careful the string right there, it'll come unraveled because it's lightly glued too, and then the whole thing just becomes this mess, and then you got this floppy tube at the end. And, uh, um, but, but. Do these come resized? No. Yeah. You cut them. You just take a sharp knife, go right through it. It's gonna cut everything but the wire. Take a pair of wire cutters, cut the last piece left, and there's your end. If it fits like it is right there over whatever you want it to fit over, you're done. Put a hose clamp and call it a day, just like it is up there. Um, occasionally, the thing that it has to slide over, it will not slide over with the spiral wound in there. So you got to unwind part of it 
cut it shorter and, and it's a process. You have to bend it around. This isn't a class for that and stick it down in here and then put the hose clamp on. But if I, if I can get the wire to, to stay, I will. Of course, then you got this end down here that, you know, you can see looks like they might have smeared a bunch of RTV, high temp RTV around the edge to keep it from unraveling. Good for them. That works. Um, all right. But this wasn't really a scat thing. So, um, all right, provides warm air for it to melt the ice. Let's see, uses heat muff around exhaust, uses heat um, from around exhaust. What happens when you pull carb heat? RPM drops. Is that good or bad? Better than what you Better. Want. Is should it? <laughs> when carb heat is applied, there is a loss of power. Why? All right. Loss of power due to less dense air. Due to less dense air. A loss of air density. Even with no ice, just going to drop. So we do that on takeoff, pre-takeoff checks. Run it up to your check RPM. I do 1700. Mags, right, both, left, both. Check my mags. What am I looking for with the mag when I do a mag check? What if I don't get an RPM drop? Exceptionally good day? Well, something's not shutting off. It doesn't drop. Something's not shutting off. So you got a problem. So no drop is bad. What, how much drop should I see? 100 yeah, about 100, 150. Um, and not much difference between the two, like 50 RPM between the two. All right, so I go back to both. Then I reach over, I grab carb heat, pull it out. What should I see? 100, 150, 200 RPM drop. Depends on how rich you're running. But is there a maximum drop I have to worry about? Like, ooh, that was 500. That's too much. Probably. Hot air is hot air. I mean, it's, it's just, if it drops 500, then you got a mixture problem. Problem's not with the carb heat. Problem's with mixture. So, yeah, there's sometimes I'll run up my airplane and I go to one mag and, and uh, the airplane starts to die. Any ideas why? I do a mag check, go to one mag, and it just, actually, now I take it back. It doesn't do that. When I run it up, it starts to die as I push in the throttle. Too lean. Yeah, yeah, too lean. Yeah, the red knob pulled all the way out. So just, oh, yeah. the mags. Yeah. When I go to the mags, what do I see on my EGT when I switch it? Uh, it goes up. It goes up. Yep. Burn takes longer. All right. So car heat, there's a loss of power due to less dense air. Um, is it okay to use the carb heat whenever you want? No. Why not? Well, that is true. I didn't think about that. Use of carb heat. Um, at high power settings, people do weird things. Um, I can call. Yeah. Can cause detonation, pre-ignition problems. You can light off. You can get the air hot enough in the intake manifold to light it off. If it's a hot day. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that. There is, and I don't know, there's, I don't have any good information on this. Alcohol injection for anti-carb ice. So, this alcohol is injected um, from a spray, spray ring, located at carb inlet for anti-ice let's I don't know what plane has that never seen it don't have a drawing just read it somewhere I'm like oh, I'll throw that in there probably for like really cold weather conditions. probably probably like you know on dc3s or something like that Phil might know all right uh, we had three types of ice which I think we already covered what are my three types? Impact ice. All right. 
Impact ice. Well, let's talk about impact ice since we're on this page. What is impact ice? Ice, ice, ice. Snow and ice that hits the aircraft. Uh, what temperature would that happen? Yeah, 32 degrees or less when it's snowing. Well, doesn't it get to like a point where it gets so freaking cold that the moisture just freezes in the air and drops to the ground and then you don't get anything? Well, as it's dropping, you're hitting it in the airplane. So. <laughs> right? So if it's dropping from above, you're running into it. Well, Evan's just on the runway. He's yeah. Sure. Oh. Uh, what's, the, what's my biggest problem with impact ice? Uh, Carpet doesn't do anything. Right? So it can can block the air filter. So what do you do about it? Alt air, alt air. Well, I don't have alt air on my plane. Carb heat is, carb heat is, it, carb heat will carb heat is, no, is just an alternate air source at that point. It will not melt the ice. So. Yeah, like, but then you, the, you're pulling from a different section. So your Correct. air filter blocks, you pull from the muck. Yes. So carb heat will not melt this ice, but it does provide an alternate source of air. And you probably don't have to worry about detonation problems because you're flying around at freezing temperatures anyway. But I don't... I was trying to think of what type of airplane would fly in known icing conditions with a carburetor. Probably not. You cannot go flying around in known icing conditions unless you have an aircraft that is certified for known icing conditions, which is going to have leading edge and boots or weeping wing or um, and you have to have that on the tail surfaces and uh, prop de-ice and all that kind of stuff. So. What about all the airplanes that have the skis and shit? Well, they don't... There's like some... 170s and shit. Oh, yeah, but it's not... Okay, that's different to land or on snow. Like, I have flown several times above snowstorms. I guess they're warm. Though. But, I, you know, I'm up in the sun. It's like you can't see the ground. What's below us? Well, that's a snowstorm. I mean, it's just massive snowstorm. Like, I wouldn't want to be down there, but I'm up here where it's beautiful and sunny. And... <laughs> yeah, you can't land there. And uh, so, you know, it's beautiful and sunny, but there's snow on the ground. Well, I want to land on the snow in this beautiful, sunny weather. So there you go, skis, you can land on it. Just can't fly through the snow with those. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're moving to snowboards now. It's one in the middle. <laughs> that was good. Uh, oh, what's my other type of ice? All right, we'll go backwards. Throttle ice. Uh, when's it most likely to happen? Uh, what happens at part throttle, part throttle, I'll put low power, low power. Um, when is that most likely to happen? Landing. At landing um, or operations where prop is windmilling. Let me see, it'd be somewhat common, common on carbs. Um, I put it here, it can happen in pressure carbs, but it's scary if it doesn't have a carb heat. Known on carbs and not likely with fuel injection. Ooh, and last one, throttle ice. And evaporation ice. And when does that happen? Yep. Okay, so it occurs when fuel evaporates in the throttle area, which is where it's supposed to happen.
There we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, ooh, I like this one. Can happen. Anybody know the temperature range? 32 to 100 degrees. 32 to 100 degrees. Awesome. How'd you know that one? You told us. Oh. Said and so you remembered? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> when humidity is high. Humidity is high. Actually, over 50%. So over 50%. Um... In the fuel tanks? It doesn't evaporate like that. Okay. No. Okay. All right. So also common in carburetors, we know that. Probably not going to happen for pressure carbs or uh, fuel injection. All right. We got all that. Evaporation ice. We got our ice. We know how to get rid of it. If I have carburetor ice, what are my symptoms? Running rich. Well, first we got to divide it into two things. So I have a fixed pitch propeller, Cessna 150 or something. How am I going to know that I'm starting to ice up? We'll assume I'm flying along and it's icing up. What's loss of power? I'm flying along and I start sinking. What am I, what, what am, loss of power? Or no, mental pressure, right? Go down. Is that a constant? Don't a lot of them have like carb heat or carb temps? What's that? The temperature of the air coming in through the carb? What about it? Isn't there a gauge in the cockpit? Not often. He asked about uh, carburetor air temp gauge. A lot of planes don't have it. Okay. There are, there are many that have it, but. So in a carb temp gauge, it's just going to have, like mine has a yellow zone and then a not yellow zone. So when it gets in the yellow zone, it's like you're likely to ice. And the outside of yellow zone, we probably won't. So, all right, what are my symptoms for fixed pitch? He said loss of power. All right, we, come on, you guys are going into second year in a few weeks. You got to start doing better than just throw it out like loss of power. What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Loss of RPM. Now he's talking. Loss of RPM. That is correct. So, uh, loss of RPM. That's that's it. Um, what what is what is the cure? Cure. All right. Car, yeah. More RPM. Yeah. Carb heat. What happens when I pull the carb heat on? It's going to get worse, so I'll put that, but I'm not doing that again. <laughs> Just got worse. Now what do I do? So pull it out. Things get worse. worse. And then, they get back. Just like then they start to get better. Then I push it in and it gets even better, even better. more better. <laughs> constant speed. What's, what am I going to see my constant speed? Loss of power, right? Yeah. Loss of power. <laughs> That however you want. So what what gauge am I going to be looking at? Manifold pressure. Loss of manifold pressure. How come the RPM didn't go down? Because it's a constant speed. Because the prop is working, doing what it's supposed to. What's the cure? Carb heat. Carb heat. <laughs> when I pull in the carb heat, what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. All right. <laughs> Same thing. So constant speed, you see a loss of manifold pressure because the throat's starting to close up. It's like you've had a bad allergic, the airplane's having a bad allergic reaction, throat's closing up. It's having an asthma attack. There you go, having an asthma attack. And so, but why did it stay at, well, we'll get into that. Uh, so yeah, you pull the inhaler button, carb heat, and it all works. Okay. Uh, let's talk about exhaust systems. That was it. Loss of power. That's it? <laughs> Those are your symptoms. Okay, well. We could put uh, loss of airspeed. Okay. <laughs> loss of airspeed. Loss of altitude. Loss of, uh, loss of altitude. 
and if you, and if you don't do anything about it, you'll have a post-flight crash. <laughs> As whatever, what's his name? Tim Henderson. Tim Henderson would say. All right. Uh, Larry's actually going to go over more exhaust systems, but I think it's important we touch on exhaust system uh, briefly because we're talking about turbochargers and such in a few minutes. So uh, exhaust system uh, defined as a scavenging system. <clears throat> system that collects. And disposes. of high temperature um, poisonous gases. And do I mention it? Yes, I do. All right, uh, poisonous gases. Um, what is in the exhaust gas? Carbon CO. If you are exposed to carbon monoxide, somebody told me the other day that it actually attacks and eats your brain cells. There's just no coming back from it. But oh, that's another problem with that. This, at all. I know, I'm immune to that. <laughs> Jokes on you, carbon monoxide. I got nothing for you to eat. <laughs> but so does alcohol. So I don't know. Um, what is the treatment for somebody who has carbon monoxide poisoning? 100% oxygen. Well, what would be the first thing? <laughs> Remove them from that. Is that enough? No. Actually, you need hyperbaric chamber. Oh. I would probably rather die from the carbon monoxide poisoning than go into hyperbaric chamber. I've taken people when I drove ambulance to hyperbaric chambers up at Mercy San Juan, and if they haven't increased in, in uh, technology since then, you're going to knock me out to get me into one. Because you ever watch old submarine movies where they got they put the torpedo in the, in the tube? That's what they used. Uh, made out of plexiglass, about that thick. So you got claustrophobia, I'm guessing? And when I saw those, I did. And uh, they're just enough that your body goes in. So they're just about just enough so a person like me would fit in. And they close it from the outside, the big door, and crunk. Oh. It's plexiglass. You can see through it. But you ain't getting out unless somebody it's, lets you out. It's a, what is it, iron lung? No, your whole body's in the thing. <laughs> so. And then they do pure oxygen under pressure. And that's, that's or you, if, if that's well, we severe. Say, like, yeah, that's severe. severe. That sounds expensive. I know, it's, it's too much. How much is it going to cost me? If, if you're available, I think, to worry about it, ask how much it is, you probably don't need it. Maybe that's a thing. How long do you guys stay in that? Um, I, I used to take people, they had wounds, so really bad wounds that pressurized oxygen was the cure, so they would go into those things. And I'm like, I don't do want to do that. how long? I don't know, a half hour, hour, or something like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if you said it would be like three days, like, dude. No, no, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it was a one-way trip. Half hour, half hour, maybe, or something. I don't know. Yeah, because, like, Kevin was the one putting him in there. Has anybody here not had an MRI? What? Yeah, MRI was originally designed to, to uh, diagnose uh, claustrophobia. So. Really? <laughs> yes. As little as three minutes or as long as two hours. Three minutes. <laughs> that's for the person. That's, to, I know, yeah, that's exactly how they timed that person. No, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, obviously they're carbon monoxide. So it'll kill you if it gets into the cabin. Um, also, uh, gases are hot. Are hot and can cause a fire. How hot is exhaust gas? It's like 1,400 degrees. At least and up. All right, um, so exhaust systems. Um, we're talking about exhaust systems. What's the material? Uh, not that scat tube stuff. Um, corrosion resistant steel. Um, usually a stainless, which is a nickel or Manel, which is nickel copper. Uh, 
um, possibly ceramic coated. So I bring this up to tell you that we mechanics likes to fix everything, don't we? And uh, if you're a really good welder, people are going to bring you a lot of exhaust systems to weld. But you have to know the base metal before you weld it. Otherwise, you create problems. So for that reason, I say, uh, what did I say? Don't, don't weld on this stuff unless you actually know the base metal. So no welding unless you know the base metal, base material. There's a lot of risk in welding exhaust pieces. If you have a crack in the heat muff area, I would never, ever consider a weld repair. It's garbage at that point. Because if you have a crack in the heat muff, you will die. die. Or you won't, but the person you welded it for will. It's just that serious. Um, let me see. I've got... The ceramic coating would be on the inside of it, correct? I think it's on the out, around the outside. You see it on the outside. So Can you have on the outside? Hmm? Can you have pipes re ceramic? What? Can you have pipes re ceramic coated? Probably. I, I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, people do a lot of stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, I said two types of systems. Two types of systems. I don't know why there. Whatever. I feel like there's more. In my head, I can make more. Um, this sounds more like a breakfast. Short stacks. I should say different types of systems is what I should say. Throttle <coughs> ice, carbide. There we go. So short stacks. Not much to them. Comes out of the cylinder. And out. Or this little Continental, probably A65. What's this thing right here? That's the heat muff right there. So it goes down and connects and then out. So. What's that? Heat muff. Heat muff, yeah. On an annual inspection you, or 100 hour, you always take this off and look for cracks. Some aircraft, you have to do it every 25 hours. And it's Jesus Christ. Uh, the, um, for, um, what is it? Uh, Indiana Jones. Like, uh, what is it? Nine or anything like that? No, you wouldn't. Not for a general annual inspection. You take a vacuum cleaner and you put the hose on the other side so it blows. So you water. And then you, uh, yeah. Put, put that up the tailpipe, seal it with rags, and then spray soapy water all over the place. Okay. Look for bubbles. If that's how you check a tire, then uh, okay, but that's not how I check a tire. <laughs> There's only a couple PSI out of the vacuum, so that wouldn't work too well. But other than that, yes. No, like this one right here. Uh, that one you can actually see it's not cabin heat. So look, here's, I know it's not real, but there's a tube right here, scat tube right here. Yeah, cabin heat. Um, and then right there, what's that going to? Carb heat. Carb heat. So you'll have one tube that's gonna let air in, uh, and blow through, and then one, one's coming out. I was just gonna say, that's, a, <laughs> that's nice. If you do stuff like that, mm -hmm. Well, that's an O200, because it has a, that's a Lusco, isn't it? With an O200? Yeah, maybe, yeah. It's got the vacuum pump. I mean, they clearly didn't have an Adele clamp big enough. Yeah. Um, the other type is the collector type. So we'll go back here. So short stacks. Um, now, when we, we test ran aircraft on our test stand, we use short stacks about like that. I mean, they just get, we just, they were that long, we just mounted them right to the cylinders. I mean, it was blowing flame. Oh, it was so loud. Um, so short stacks, that'd be used on non-turbo, um, low horsepower engines, low horsepower engines. 
And then you have the collector system. Or collector style. I'll say style. So the collector style, well, we can have the style here like used on this radial engine, or that would be similar to what I have on my airplane or uh, 360s and up. Actually, 0320s would have this, where the pipes will come into this collector in the middle, often called a muffler, which has almost no mufflering abilities to it. It just has a flame cone in it. So that flame cone, looks just like let me see. like it's just a cone with a bunch of holes drilled in it that's all it is it's more of a flame arrester and so when you screw up and you blow this apart that's the pieces you're blowing apart how do people blow these apart Lots of priming and then start it. Yeah, so you, so you hear, you know, the crank, 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 and you just hear it. It's a light combing, usually. And then you hear, you know, the pump woo, running, and then crank, 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 bang! Woo. <laughs> so, like, well, that, it clears the carbon out real good. So, a collector system like that. Um, it's not that uncommon for the fittings to not be real tight when it's cold. Now on this, this system over here on this radial engine, this collector system, it is really loose. Uh, it rattles, or it's tight right there against the cylinder, but all of these are actually pretty dang loose. And when you test them cold with some sh uh, air and the vacuum, oh, it's gonna blow bubbles everywhere out of these things. Same here, you can expect bubbles at the joints, that's common. Um, they'll seal up when it, uh, sort of, when it gets hot. And that's what it's made to do because the engine is going to contract and expand with heat, and you can't have this exhaust out there as one piece all welded shut. It's got a, it has slip joints here and here, and uh, that's one piece there. It's got to be one there. So you have slip joints. So when the engine expands and contracts the, the, and the exhaust expands, they can do it at different rates and not crack, because this stuff is prone to cracking anyway. It's pretty bad. Anyone else? Like anything else? Oh, what they, is this a, a torque? on that or, or they just you can tighten it as much as you want um, it won't on these these they just have a band clamp that goes around it like you can see it right down there item number seven. Oh, and then you just tighten that you tighten that and like this particular band clamp you're going to tighten it all the way now when you get into and this one over here has just these little tabs it's like one tab welded on one and one on the other like that they overlap you just put one bolt in it just keeps them falling apart but when you get into these other systems, oh my goodness, um, the amount of effort that you have to deal with on a turbocharged exhaust system is, uh, I don't wanna say overwhelming, but you have to do it right. You absolutely have to do it right, or this is what happens. So these clamps right here, um, you, you have to actually read the procedure. It's like you put them on and you torque it. And then you use a rubber mallet and you tap and you kind of massage everything. Then you torque it. Then you take it out and you run the engine and then you bring it back and you torque it at the same torque. And if it moves, then you go out and you run it again. And you bring it, let it cool. Then you torque it and then you run it again. You keep doing it to the same torque value until it stops moving. And if you don't, and then there's all these ADs on these. There's sometimes these, you can't even find these because there's so many ADs on these clamps. What happens on these turbocharged engines, they're under such back pressure that when these clamps fail, it's like a blowtorch blowing through and it goes through anything, fuel lines, metal, whatever. And so a failure of one of these things is, it's, it's catastrophic. Yeah. Is there an average flight hour time for... Yeah, there is. There's, there's, uh, there's light limits on these things. After so many hours, you have to, I don't remember what it is offhand. There's some that have spot welds are bad. It's just all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I was saying like, it's like you torque it, you know, every five flight hours you check it. And no, you don't. You don't fly it. Oh, you don't fly it. You okay. literally take it out and run it. It can't, it's grounded until you're done torquing. Okay. Yeah, you don't check it every ten hours. It's like you just keep doing this procedure until 
you're finally done. Like, okay, that took like four runs, and now we're done. Okay. So my experience, it's one or two runs. It's, it's usually pretty good. So uh, I think it's break time, huh? Yep. Well, it is now.